The Disruptors, the show where we have the folks who are building a better future. Today, we've got somebody doing just that. Neil Gorin Flow on the program. Neil, thanks for coming. Oh, my pleasure, Matt. So you did a you did a great job. I was listening to one of your talks recently, and I wanted to start it from there. Of okay. Building off of the World Fair. Why was the World Fair transformational? Take me back to that. Well, I gave this talk at the We Share Fest. It's been a while. Um, and I talked about, I think it was the 1937 or 1939 World's Fair. And, um, you know, this uh, was a incredibly successful public relations event put on by, uh, put on by corporate America, basically. Um, million, tens of millions of people came to it. It was an enormous scale. Um, and it was an immersive experience for those who attended that they got a taste for the uh, a future which um, corporate America was imagining for America um, that, of course, uh, deeply kind of involved them. Right. So this was a kind of uh, a future where private industry shaped everyday life uh, and and, uh, um, you know, and I think. It uh, set the stage for um, the post-war American dream, um, uh, a, a one of you know a kind of suburban civilization with, with you know very high consumption and uh, and uh, with a, a lot of social and environmental problems that you know cropped up later. Um, and and you know the the reason why I brought it up is is. Uh, because um, I feel like I feel like a similar kind of dream has been promoted by the tech tech sector, um, and it could be a similarly, and it seems to more and more be uh, a kind of false dream with a lot of problems, um, you know. And and as I reflect also on it, you know, it's now you know a few years later um, that it's also a lesson. Uh, for the for movement builders, uh, which is, you know, if you want to build a future, um, a new future or something different, uh, more sustainable and fair, is that you have to give people a really good taste for it. That that you have to do something of similar importance and magnitude as uh, what corporate America did during the thirty nine World's Fair. Um, it give that kind of immersive experience um, and, uh, you know. Ideally, that they walk away transformed, that they see themselves in the world in a different way and see uh, the possibilities um, and uh, a commitment is born, at least some of the people who participate in whatever it is you, you create, to work towards it. Um, you know, I, I just watched the, uh, a documentary about Woodstock, um, and that was, a, a, I think, a similar uh, kind of... Um, moment in history uh, where a large group of people it was like 400,000 people they didn't, couldn't get a, an accurate accurate count but that's the size of a, a small to medium sized city who lived together without violence through uh, and got through the three days uh, because they cooperated and helped one another uh, the, the conference organizers were ill prepared but the one thing that they did do is set the expectation um, that this would be peaceful, fun, uh, uh, and, and um, that we would that we're all together in it, and that to get through it, um, you know, we're gonna have to work together and share resources. So, so uh, yeah, just you know, just a few thoughts about that. Yeah, no one gets too excited about a half-assed utopia or a half-assed dystopia. You kind of like, you kind of got to go for it if you're going for it, right? Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think that movement builders need to get. Uh, much bolder and that these, you know, some of the campaigns that we see, uh, they're too one dimensional, you know, um, and they don't involve enough. Uh, for example, um, you know, you know like they should have, uh, sh you know, art and music should be involved, for, for instance, right? And it shouldn't only be, it shouldn't only be about what not to do, like stop global warming. It's like, what is the, what does the world feel like? And what is the world like? What is it shaped like? A world that, you know, gets us 
um, helps us make progress to, you know, towards some of the, you know, sustainable development goals and, uh, you know, mitigating the effects of, of climate change. Um, so there has to be a lot more yes in the solutions than no, um, and a lot more joy and connection and fun and, um, you know, and also uh, meeting people's practical needs at the same time. So I'll volley that question right back to you. How? Um, well, you know, in, in our, our in, in our space, uh, there there is uh, you know, a couple of couple of thoughts on that. Um, first, in our space, is this idea of dual power, which is um, you uh, you know the first part of it is that you build the world that you want to live in um, and uh, an economy. But based on solidarity, like that's a big start, you know, cooperatives, et cetera, right? And you share resources and uh, and so that's, you know, it becomes a kind of home base where needs are getting met. But then the, the second part of dual power is to engage with, uh, engage with the political system and, you know, fight, um, defend and also make progress towards your, your vision, right? So there's a, this idea of dual power. Um, which I think is a very powerful one, and um, because it speaks to not only people's everyday life and needs, but also their longer-term, you know, aspirations, um, and is is very, I think, practical also. Um, and then the other the other thing uh, that I've been thinking about is um, is uh, you know inspired by some of the things we write about uh, and report on um, at Shareable. Uh, there's particularly there's this there's this project in in the UK called Participatory City, and um, you know they've like kind of cracked the code on how to get people to participate in civic life. You know they really thought about how to remove the barriers and and uh, and invite people in to make their communities better. You know in in ways that they uh, want to. You know a lot of uh, people hatching their own projects and their own ideas and being part of a kind of platform with the ideas like, uh, and that's their slogan, is everyone every day. Um, and, you know, I would only add, like, everyone every day, everywhere. Like, if, if you're talking about a local community, is that that your vision is embodied in events and experiences um, over a long period of time, but, but every, you know, uh, on an everyday basis, um, and uh, that involve everyone. And there are many expressions of, of uh, this, you know, vision that, you know, um, there's no avant-garde, it, uh, everyone um, is involved. So, um, you know, and that, you know, and I see it as a part of a layer that gets really ignored. Um, you know, you have to have, uh, you know, values and a vision and a mission um, and you need, you know, policies and new services and new economy and new infrastructure. But at just below that level of culture, which is the top, everything rolls down from culture, right, is programming. You have to program the culture, right? Um, and, you know, the same way that uh, corporate America programs our culture with advertising, um, you know, movements need to program the culture for change. And uh, um, and but not do it through advertising, which is impersonal and, you know, kind of mass produced and, you know, uh, often insulting or uh, provocative or, you know, designed to make you feel like shit. So you buy some. Yeah, right. Exactly. It's kind of downgrades are us as humans rather upgrades. This is this is more uh, about getting people out of their homes, off their screens, in the streets with each other, creating the place and the. Uh, and the world that they want locally, you know, uh, one of the paradoxes of the of uh, when you're thinking about uh, social change and uh, is that people's attention seems to be directed uh, towards uh, things like national elections where they have the least influence, um, where uh, they might be better. We all might be better off. We put a bigger balance of our attention and energy is where we have the most influence, which is with our neighbors and our neighborhoods um, in our cities and towns. Why do you think the attention is that dichotomy where it is going, and at least your idea is the wrong way? I wouldn't say it's the wrong way. I'm sure, I, you know, I think we need to... A less effective it, way in terms of how much effort for impact. 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, I, I see, you know, we live in a global world and there's multiple scales to take action in your personal life and family, neighborhood, you know, all the way to the global scale. And as a global citizen, you need to think about where to distribute your attention and energies across that across that scale. Um, and I just think that the local level is really ignored um, and more attention and energy should be put there. And, and uh, you know, I think it has to do with our media system, um, why, we, uh, why we do that, uh, um, you know, the, the, and, and our, also our culture, you know, we've, we've, we've uh, marginalized civic life, you know, civics, you know, it sounds like so boring and, is, and it's also made boring, but, um, and I think we can reverse that. I think we can make, um, we can make civic life uh, the thing that you sh that can't be missed, you know, just think of, of, of uh, you know, combining some of the best festivals that you, you know, we see in the world, you know, from Burning Man to, um, you know, festival in, 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 uh, in Brazil and, and uh, Mardi Gras in New Orleans, but combine that with uh, uh, a civic a process, right? So it's both celebratory and practical where we're celebrating, but we're also, um, working together to, uh, um, you know, develop agendas and take action to make our communities better and make our lives better. How does participa uh, How does participatory budgeting play into that? Well, I think it plays a really and what big is, and what is participatory budgeting? Yeah, sure, sure. But so participatory budgeting, and you know, it's a really simple uh, concept: is that the taxes that you, you as neighbors decide together how taxes um, either all or a portion, usually it's a portion, it's just a portion, um, are spent where you live. So, you, you know, you and your neighbors know best what your neighborhood needs. And so then you work with the city through a budget, a participatory budgeting process to propose projects and then they get funded. And then all, and sometimes, you know, neighbors also participate in the execution of, of, uh, of um, you know the projects in, in the neighborhood, so so this is you know kind of direct democracy. You know people get to decide how their tax dollars are spent in their local you know local area. So it's really cool and something that's spreading around the world. There are thousands of cities now that do it. It's you know starting to take off in the United States, um, though it, it's a little slower going. There's more you know more places outside the United States that do it. Um, Why do and, you think that is? Is it just red tape? Um, um, you know, good, good question. I mean, I, I, um, I, I think it, it's a combination of that, that just low awareness about it, um, and that once you get it established and working in some and in, in some places in the United States, that you know, that's how things change in government. Usually, is like somewhere, someone somewhere else does it successfully, and it's you know, and it really does work. And then they'll go like, okay, it works there, it can work here. Um, and so you just need to kind of reach a critical mass. And the other thing is, I just think that, again, you know, we've marginalized uh, civic civic life. It's it's something, you know, it's not the focal point of our our lives at all. It's a marginal thing. It's is it because we live in suburbs? We try to separate ourselves. We live in suburbs, but I think you know, I would, uh, you know, go a step earlier is that what we've done, I think, especially over the last 30 or so years um, um, with the influence of the conservative revolution is we've created what, what uh, some sociologists call a market society. So there's, there, there is, you know, there is an economic, you know, a kind of economic phenomenon called the market, right? Um, where people buy and sell goods and, you know, the law of supply and demand rules, right? That's one thing. A market society is where you take the values of the marketplace and you redefine society and how we interact with each other uh, based on, on those values. And that's what I think is really corrosive and, and has undermined what I, what I think is the most, one of the most valuable assets that our country has, which is this uh, history of of, uh, of civic life, of the civic culture, 
Um, I, I believe that a civic culture is, and others would agree, that it is actually the basis for, for wealth. So I think iron ironically that in our pursuit of uh, economic success, we may have we may have killed the goose that lays the golden eggs. Like that, our civic uh, our civic life, our civic culture is the, is that goose. And I would at least add to that, if not economic, then certainly quality of life. Because if you look at a comparison between Europe and the U.S. It's, it's no comparison. So you've talked before about the great capitalist experiment. Tell me what you mean. Well, I think in the, la the last 30 years, we, you know, we've kind of run, or at least, you know, um, maybe especially the last 30 years, you know, really doubled down on this idea of, you know, a free market and, um, you know, small government uh, and, um, you know, and I, I think the, the results, you know, the results are kind of in from that experiment that it's, you know, deeply flawed and causes a lot of suffering, you know, uh, environmental damage and, um, and that, you know, we really need a new vision for the country, uh, that, that, that hasn't worked. It's been tried. It hasn't worked. So, you know, go into those stats because a lot of people don't know or don't believe. Yeah. I mean, um. Yeah, now you're probably going back to that talk I gave at, at WeShare Fest, you know, where I mentioned the, the 39 World's Fair. But, you know, you have to look at how the United States is, is ranked on a lot of social indicators um, in the, you know, in the, um, especially when compared to um, other developed nations, uh, quote unquote, developed nations. And we're, you know, at the at the bottom and many important ones like um like uh, you know, healthcare and pollution, and how we treat women, and you know, I, I could go on. There's like a long list I give in that in that talk. So so you know, you just have to see how we're ranked on those social indicators, and and I think that's one. Um, I think it makes you know it makes a really strong argument that like okay, we're on the wrong track. You know, we may be extremely wealthy and have this big uh, GDP, but you know, we're throwing this, our society under the bus to get there. So we need to you know rethink things. Speaking of throwing the society under the bus, we're headed towards driverless and we got tons of gig workers. What do you predict for our future? <laughs> what do I predict for our future? Uh, wow, that's a big one. Thanks, Matt. You know, just you know, land that on me. That's, that's what I'm cool. here for. <laughs> right. Um, you know, first, I, first the, 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 you know, you know, this is kind of like my standard thing I say when people ask me to predict is which, which is like, I, you know, I think our jobs aren't to predict, but to make what we want, right, is is to think about, you know, the kind of people we want to be, the kind of relationships we want to have, the kind of society we want, and work backwards from that to make that happen, right? So so uh, it, instead of looking looking forward, what we might, uh, what we might, might do, also, or instead, is look deeply, in, deeply inside, and reflect on those things, and then think about, um, you know, uh, you know, the actions to take. Um, you know, I. Uh, but to you know, to to answer your question a little bit, um, a little bit more directly, uh, and I say more directly because uh, I'm like one of those people that often, you know stays on message or, you know, uh, and, or changes the question, but, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, um, I'm, you know, I'm not bullish on self-driving cars. I don't think that is a very productive direction. I think that the, our, our car civilization, um, was a mistake and, uh, a misstep. Um, and that just extending it with like a newer, shinier, better cars is like kind of stupid. Can we fix it without scrapping the U.S. though? Just the way it's structurally built. Um, you know, I think it's very hard because we, you know, we've invested a ton of resources, and a lot of our country is already built. So we have this, um, you know, sprawling infrastructure. You know, it's, uh, um, you know, one of the things we did was. You know, the spatial organization of the United States is different than other countries um, and is unique, you know, and it goes and it, part of the part of the reason it is, is the way that we did zoning. And the other part is because we're a racist country. 
and our housing and zoning policies were deeply racist. Um, and and uh, um, so, you know, in terms of zoning, is we divided functions of a city into three basic things. This is called Euclidean zoning. So there's, um, you know, residential, commercial, and um, and industrial, right? So in our areas, it's more mixed use. So you're already dividing dividing those, you know, by three, right? You're using your land um, uh, ineffectively by dividing those uses. Um, and then what we did with the residential pieces of that is we we made a monumental commitment to the single family home as the American ideal, right? So in, in many major cities in the United States, 70%, over 75%, 75% and over of the um, residential land is committed to single family homes. Um, so so uh, that that is... Is that racism uh, or consumerism, though? If you can sell something both. for more expensive, it's, yeah. It's it's actually both. It's actually both. We, um, you know, and there's a long history to this. The, the short story is that it was unconstitutional to do zoning based on racism, so they created single family zoning, um, which made it unaffordable for you know uh, working class and poor people and people of color and immigrants to buy homes in those areas. So it was it was a kind of shadow racist zoning policy or, um, crypt, you know, crypto sort of, you know, uh, on the surface, not racist, but in practice, deeply racist. Right. And, um, and the other reason why we double, you know, committed to single family homes is because it would stoked our economy that it was good for consumption, um, that, you know, Everyone had to fill their home up with all kinds of appliances and goods and furniture. And, you know, everyone had to have a car, um, you know, and, you, you know, you have a single family home. It's expensive. So you have a 30 year mortgage. So this is a way to secure your labor market and your, your workers and control your workers. Right. They, you know, you got to stick to the job. You've got a 30 year. No. Right. So, um, you know, this was part of the, the you know, their antecedents, but this was part of the, the you know the, the post-war period. This this idea really came uh, uh, to fruition, right? And now we're kind of experiencing the hangover of it and starting to rethink it. Um, uh, Minneapolis just at the end of last year banned single-family um, uh, detached units. I think, um, I think and, Portland did as well. Yeah, and it's starting to in the Pacific Northwest. You're starting to. Um, think about that also. And you have, I think it's SB 50 in California, which didn't make it through, but was a similar effort. Um, and, you know, the, the idea is to uh, upzone the single family areas so you can put more housing on these lots. And, and uh, you know, in, in areas zoned single family, you can't have multifamily units. You can't have dupl uh, duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, and small apartment buildings, only single family homes, right? So w in the United States, we use a, an incredible amount of land um, for, uh, for single family homes. And it's a very, obviously a very inefficient way to house our population. Um, it creates all the sprawl and all the attendant problems of sprawl. Uh, traffic jams, high cost, high infrastructure costs, etc. Um, social isolation, um, you know, and and uh, um, so you know that's you know we're starting to really rethink that as the housing crisis really builds and and you know people just you know just uh, the the household budget just doesn't add up. It's, people just can't afford the high housing costs. Will and, build, you know, will building up be enough though? That would only wouldn't that only imply it would be enough if the population just keeps growing? Otherwise, you kind of have, or are you going to have empty houses? Well, apparently, apparently, God, we have six empty houses for every homeless person in the U.S. That in alone right. is a mind-blowing stat. Right. So, so I mean, one, uh, you know, you know, one, appro one approach is, um, and it was kind of a precursor to banning single-family homes, and also is really picking up speed as a trend is this. Um, is ADUs, accessory dwelling units, the ability to put additional housing on a single family plot, right? So have a, a you know, a mother-in-law, uh, or granny flat, you know, in the, in the basement, um, or put a, like a tiny home in the backyard, um, or redo your garage uh, and make it a, a, a living unit. So, you know, you take all of those houses, 
um, and um, and a good uh, you know high percentage or maybe a majority of them they you would be able to put at least one or two units on. Um, so we can get you know we can grow housing quickly that way um, if there is more institutional support and it's streamlined more. You know it's it's started very slowly back in two, uh, 2016. Um, mostly like the, the movement for ADUs, it's picked up steam, you know, some jurisdictions have streamlined it. Um, and now, you know, we've gone from a trickle of like, app, you know, applications to put in ADUs to, uh, you know, in California, particularly to thousands. Um, and it, you know, it can, I think it can pick up additional speed when, um, there's more prefab housing and financing available, so you can really just kind of pump it, up, pump out the housing supply using that strategy. It's not, it's not the, you know, the, the solution, but it can be part of the solution. But then there's also the people that not in my backyard. They've been sold the vision of investing in your home is a good investment, which that uh, it's probably not. But in terms of if we add more supply, we don't add uh -huh. more demand. Suddenly these houses stop going up, start going down. We're already we're already on the brink of a, at least real estate recession. We're going to have a bit of a, a turn down. It didn't turn down enough and prices are higher than they were in 2008. How do we, how do we handle that? If suddenly people who are living, especially baby boomers, they're, they're probably going to have social security. The next generation certainly won't. Their value is tied up in their house, which would be going down now in value. Yeah. The, um, you know, it's, of course, it's a bubble, and um, you know bubbles pop. So uh, there, there may not be a graceful way to handle it. Um, and you know that you know this is what happens when you point, you know, hundreds of billions, maybe even trillions of dollars at the market and make the that credit super cheap and easy to get at, um, and make that asset, you know, uh, a global commodity. But that's what you know housing has become in the United States, the global commodity, not. Uh, not a service, not a method to to uh, you know shelter people, uh, but a global commodity. So you know, uh, I don't think there is an easy, painless way to de-escalate from that. Um, so uh, on the other hand, this this uh, this um, this trend to upzone single-family areas uh, could could be a windfall for homeowners. Um, their their land. Could you know could become more even more valuable and create even more uh, you know kind of wealth inequality uh, because you know when you upsell and you're basically saying you can house more people on the same amount of land and that makes the land more valuable um, you know uh, you know in theory so so um, which could yeah, and, cause more problems yeah which you know there'll there'll be other there'll be other problems with that particularly if like I think the the problem you know. Is that those who have been left out of that wealth building process, uh, you know, African Americans, people of color, you know, people who can't get credit for one reason or another, or don't have the the financial otherwise have the financial resources to buy a home, you know, they they you know are left further behind, and you know that's definitely not not fair, and I, I think particularly to to African Americans because that you know a lot of the policies have been um, you know specifically uh, targeted to, you know, exclude them. Um, and you know, the, 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 that's the other side of the other side of this, you know, the zoning story that I told you, you know, just shared briefly, it's just kind of sketch really, um, is, is that while there was this post-war boom in suburban America, which was part of the, uh, very important part of the, uh, wealth building process for middle or white middle-class Americans, on the other hand, uh, blacks were not able to buy homes. Um, it's just like inflation for everyone, but certain people have higher levels of inflation because they're not involved in the economy. Yeah, the, yeah. The so you know basically when you segregate, I, I think of what we did as a kind of uh, as the American apartheid that we live in an apartheid system, but we don't recognize it. We have a myth that that hides it. From do you think us. it? Do you think it was intentional, or do you think it was an accidental policy? Um, oh, it was, it was, it was definitely intentional, but what makes it different from say the case of South Africa is that, um, we had a myth that masked what was going on, 
um, you know, that the myth, you know, the American dream and the myth of like a level playing field. And if you work hard, every, you know, if anyone can get ahead. Um, and uh, but underneath that, uh, you had three levels, levels of government that were doing things often not in coordination to create a segregated society. Right. So so it's really hard. It's really hard to see um, because it's, uh, you know, also it's it's, you know, a segregated society is against our Constitution. Right. But we did it anyway. We you know, so there's a book on my and my bookshelf that I'm I'm going through now called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. And this is like the main point of our book is uh, of this book is that we purposely created segregation that the federal government was is implicated in it. Uh, they, they were, uh, and they, and we, we broke our own, you know, constitution to do it. And so therefore we're, the federal government is responsible to, uh, to fix and even re repair, do rep rep reparations for, for the, for that crime, basically. Let's play devil's advocate. When does that stop being the case? So how far back in time? Does it suddenly not make sense to have that argument? Because I feel like you could have that argument to time eternity. And if you're always looking backwards, it's hard to look forward. Yeah, um, you know, that's a great question. I'm not sure I'm like, to be honest, Matt, like perfectly equipped to, to answer that. The, but in the, uh, in the case of housing, this is recent. This is like in the last, you know, 50 years that a lot of this unfolded so it isn't distant and we live with the effects of it today even though some of it, if not most of the laws that created the system have been rolled back um we live with the effects today and and uh um and those who are most affected uh, affected uh are 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 deeply impacted from it so so yeah it's a great question i don't have an answer but i think um you know just that's just a little bit of perspective i'll give you a more fun question let's go rainbows and unicorns i give you a magic wand. <laughs> i give you a magic wand how do you fix the problem <laughs> man i tell you what you know one of the things why i'm you know i'm you know this is fresh on my mind because we are doing an editorial series about this very thing about housing in the united states and you know how to better share land and manage our or regulate land use um, and you know we haven't finished it so we haven't like researched all the solutions because that's you know that's part of what we do is solutions journalism so we definitely have to understand the problem but we want to report on the, the solutions um, and and uh, I, I honestly that now that I'm right in the middle of it but I haven't finished it you know I think this is a very difficult problem I think it's you know that we set in motion we made our investments and laid out the spatial organization of our society. And this is very, very difficult to change. Um, but, you know, I, uh, and in the history, you know, I've done a timeline of this, which we'll publish on shareable.net. Um, and what that timeline shows is that every turn in the housing market made it worse uh, for uh, those who've already been excluded and negatively impacted. And so, you know, what we see with SB 50 and the upzoning could be the same story all over again. It's like an effort to change things and make things better, but just makes it worse for those who've already been excluded. So, so, um, you know, uh, um, you know, that's, that's a way of saying that, you know, I'm not sure yet what the right way to do this is. Um, and, and I don't think anybody is sure. And if they think they know, I think, um, I would, uh, I would, you know, I would. They're full of shit. You don't know what you don't. Know. I would if you, yeah. If they think they know, then and if they're sure, I, I would say I, I would suspect that they need to do a little bit more research, especially about the history. Yeah, definition of mastery is knowing that you don't know. Um, let's go into a little bit more happy topics. Talk to me about the sharing economy. <laughs> where you see us headed? Pros and cons. Yeah. So. Um, the sharing economy, uh, 
um, you know, what, something of great promise that, you know, was, I think, distorted a lot by the influx of the like tidal wave of venture capital and became, you know, more business as usual, if not more aggressive and more exploitative than business as usual. The, you know, Airbnb and, and Uber and Lyft being being the examples. But behind that, though, is a real sharing economy. And that's what we write about at, um, at shareable.net. And and that real that real sharing economy is uh, embodied very strongly in a movement that we started called Sharing Cities. And um, this is back in 2011. We had this event called um, Share San Francisco, um, where we first started thinking about um, sharing kind of meet meet cities, the real sharing kind of meet cities. And um, and if you think about it, you know this makes sense. You know, a, a city is a shared enterprise. Um, the quality of life um, and the reason to be there uh, um, is because so much is shared. And, and uh, with, um, you know, over 50% of the world's population being in cities and being connected by the Internet or by, mo by mobile phones, um, that the opportunity to share even more, you know, you know was, became kind of obvious and, you know, a opportunity for uh, for big sh positive shift, you know, if this movement is conceived and shaped correctly. Um, you know, since then, uh, there are 100 plus cities that have sharing cities programs and um, some of the biggest cities in the world, including Seoul, South Korea, uh, they have one of the most ambitious programs. Um, uh, there's a, a newer one in Sweden called Sharing City Sweden. And it's four cities in Sweden that are working together. Uh, one interesting facet of that uh, program is, is that they're starting to think not just of services, but of infrastructure. So as part of that program, of that effort, they are building a sharing neighborhood for 2,000 people from scratch in a, in a neighborhood of, uh, in Sege Park, a neighborhood of, of Malmo. And, um, you know, I think that's a really important advance, uh, uh, you know, and it really connects to what we were saying is like the suburbs are uh, a, you know, unsustainable, like spatial organization of the society, right? It's high cost, high consumption, a lot of social isolation, et cetera. Here, the thinking is completely different. How do we build a community from the bottom up that is green, that is community driven uh, and when, where people share resources and, you know, uh, another I think important facet of sharing city Sweden is is that um, you know uh, University of Lund is involved, and so there is a lot of um, planning and measurement that's going to be going along with this. Uh, so so uh, and the the four cities are part of a, a urban test bed um, program that the uh, national government um, funds and supports. Um, so this uh, could feed directly into Sweden's plans for how for their urban for urban development in general. So uh, to, I think this this really um, uh, points to the future. Contrast that with what Google's doing with sidewalk labs in Toronto, or you see <laughs> happening in China. It's kind of, <laughs> how pros and cons differences. One of them feels like it's building towards a minority report. Yeah, right. You know, the, the, you know, the, the internet was this incredibly promising thing. And, you know, I, I was, you know, drank the Kool-Aid early on too, and thought this was a, a chance for, um, you know, transformation for our society, you know, to connect people and give them chances to work together and help each other. And, you know, it's turned into a, um, you know, surveillance economy nightmare and, uh, you know, very, um, exploitative and manipulative, um, and, you know, uh, and also, I think, psychologically and socially damaging in ways we are still grappling with. So you take you, you take that ex you take that experience and that template and you apply it to this smart cities concept, which that's what Google is doing in uh, in Toronto. They want to build kind of the ultimate smart city. And I think the uh, the dangers are, are should be readily apparent um, that you could have something equally as toxic and. Um, unrewarding and you know damaging to society as the uh, as parts of the internet have become and it's also building towards a similar if it wants to be surveillance type system similar to what china's doing social credit etc it's hard to it's hard to separate between those two we had charles mann on the program a while back and he had a really cool book the 
the wizard and the prophet and it's looking at how there's two different types of people when they look at how to improve the future there's the wizard who's trying to build and create technology to make the future better and there's the prophet who's looking back to the past in ways you can take those things into the future and build the future better and they both have very conflicting views and generally speaking can't come to terms with the other side how do you view that balance of past and future when it comes to creating a better future because they don't they don't get along well but they should be able to yeah i mean the uh i think i think that uh, the you know in our book sharing cities activating the urban commons we kind of put our stake in the ground and um you're a prophet well perhaps but uh, you know, or tend in that way, but, but, uh, um, you know, we, we put our stake in the ground and said that the, the political economy for sharing the city should be the earth, should be the commons, right? So the urban commons, right? And, um, and the, you know, the, I think the urban commons may, or the commons in general may combine both the wizard and the prophet together, right? Uh, um, and it's a way of, of honoring the past and preserving cultures that that's there, but making a future together. Right. And the, and the commons, um, is, you know, a, it's basically like a democratic way to manage resources. Um, and there are three components to a commons. So there, there is the, the shared asset, there's the, the users, and there's the democratic management process, the, the, the governance of um, how the community manages that resource, those three things. Right. And, and, um, you know, this is the turn that the Sharing Cities movement is making. You know, they, this is what we wanted to happen and, and you know, have ad, advocated for. I mean, Seoul is um, making, I think, the first move. Um, they're having a conference in the fall, which I'll be attending, to, to talk specifically of sharing cities and the urban commons. And, um, and this is a way of, like, uh, basically putting that, future of the city in the hands of the people, you know, the, the people that live there and, um, and having them make the city, not, not, not experts like wizards or prophets and it's, so forth. It's democratic, but social, people, democratic socialism. Um, perhaps, I don't know if that's totally accurate way to put it, but it's close. It's close, Matt. Yeah, for sure. Is that the reason that it has had less traction in the U S because in the U.S., people seem to have uh, a cootie-like fear of socialism. Yeah, right. Um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, it's almost like a you know taboo, right, to talk about socialism. I mean, I, I mean they talk they they talk about at least as recent as the last election, just bringing up a politician as being socialist as enough to crucify them. So right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, yeah, we we have I think uh, on the, at least in the public. Um, in the mainstream media, a very um, unnuanced and, you know, immature, you know, kind of discussion about political economy. So, so this, this doesn't surprise me, but, you know, w you know, I think there has been a very concerted long-term effort to marginalize all those ideas where people, you know, come together to make their lives better, you know, the, the collectivity, um, and instead have emphasized a uh, society of political economy about private property, about individual rights and indi individual freedom um, and free markets. And, uh, and that, you know, uh, you know, there, as Margaret Thatcher, Thatcher said, you know, there is no alternative to capitalism. And that, that's, that's how, that, that's how, how far, I guess the brainwashing and the marginalization of collective ways of organizing resources has gone. How much of the problem is, at least in my opinion, the U.S. government just being much less efficient in terms of real output for what you get for the money? For instance, Germany, their government is 44% of the GDP. The U.S., their government is 40% of the GDP. In Germany, I feel like you get a heck of a lot for your taxes. Uh -huh. I, I don't know if you're living in the U.S., you're in Mountain View. I feel like you get a heck of a not a lot here. And that may just be my perspective. But even in Europe, people seem more willing to pay taxes because of the outputs they get from them. Well, yeah, I mean, we are a revolutionary country, you know, born out of revolutions. We have, a, a, I think, an inborn suspicion of 
um, you know, people ruling over us from a distance, right? And uh, and so that, you know, the federal government being 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 part of that, being part of that, um, and I think that that that's healthy to an extent, but it's gone. Uh, I think it's gone too far in this country, um, and and uh, um, you know, I, uh, and I think that certain political political um, players and you know the conservative party has has really played on that and emphasized that you know I, I forget who what politician conservative politician uh, who said this but uh, he wanted to get the federal government to the si- uh, to the size where it could be strangled in a bathtub you know could be drowned in a bathtub well, right republican sell fear democrat sell hope they're both selling something right so you know i think we've got into this into the cycle where we under we under we underfund social programs or we cripple them in, in legislative ways so they don't work and then so that provides the rationale then to not fund those things anymore like we have done with uh, with public housing, uh, which public housing is successful and uh, very successful in many other countries like they just, uh, you know I've traveled all across Europe and you you know Germany and Austria and other places like. Public housing is uh, high quality, managed well, and and uh, you know often a very high percentage of the housing stock. Um, in the United States, if you look at the history of it, we did exactly that. We made, we passed laws to fund it, but then our programs were uh, were such that uh, um, that they were designed to fail, and the, and you know conservatives were you know yeah. you know fixed it that way. Right. And if there's this great uh, documentary about Pruitt Igo, uh, the housing uh, complex um, that, you know, goes into great lengths about this. And it's very eye opening. So I recommend anyone who who has their doubts in, about public housing to look how it was look at, at that example um, and, uh, you know, and understand that we just didn't do it right. It isn't that public housing is bad. It's just we didn't do it right. And the king of capitalism told us himself, Henry Ford, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. I want to jump to the, I want to jump to the lightning round now. And sure, let, sure. Let, listeners, if you haven't supported us on Patreon, uh, Patreon, you can do so at a level of $5 or more per month. Every episode, we have bonus questions. We ask our epic guests insights into best advice they've ever received, what technologies they're most worried about, what industries they'd get into, stuff like that. If you want to help support us, support independent media who's not selling you guys to uh, Satan, so to speak, Facebook style, <laughs> then disruptors.fm slash Patreon. Now let's jump to it. The interview, I got one, two last questions before we wrap up. Okay, cool. Blockchain and decentralization. Where do you see it headed and in playing into this shared cities, shared world, shared spaces future? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but I'm skeptical about this idea that you can have um, you know, a trustless systems. I, I, I think that that is, uh, that is besides the point or the opposite of what the point is, is you want to create a society where trust, um, where you need trust and where you build trust and you build it in uh, old fashioned social networks face to face. Um, and, and, you know, I think that that is our future and our, our past and our future is, um, you know, building more social capital, um, uh, upgrading our human potential, um, our ability to collaborate, to speak to one another, to understand, to empathize, to create together. Um, that's how we have become master of the, uh, of the earth this, and that uh, of the earth. And that's how we'll master the challenges that are before us is through, uh, through collaboration and large scale collaboration. And that, that, I think that's a really good, like, uh, um, you know, definition of what humans, the, the, the essence of human beings and our, our key ability um, that other species don't have is the ability to flexibly, flexibly, flexibly collaborate at scale, right? We need to focus on developing that talent, that skill. Even with uh, 155 people that you can know in your network type deal? <laughs> it's a good counterpoint, but I think we can have federated systems that that then add up to add up to scale. But you know what? I think we do need to live 
in, um, uh, in you know, um, human scale so, human scale communities, which you know, like 150 to 250, uh, 250 people roughly, um, but that these can be connected into larger scale systems. Yeah, it's interesting how. When you come at the problem from both sides, decentralization and blockchain is more or less a libertarian's dream. And you get to the flip side of things, which is decentralized government and sharing communities, which kind of come around to similar places from very different vantage points. It'd be interesting to see if we could merge those effectively in the future. Yeah, I think there's a lot of work to be done to do that. And, uh, um, you know, it's another tool. We'll see. We'll see. I mean, you know, I... Uh, you know, I believe in human beings. I mean, that's I'm doubling down on us. <laughs> yeah, and if you if you don't believe in human beings, we have we have, we have another problem. You can go play for someone else's team. But uh, team, yeah, like Doug, Doug Rushkoff is a good. Yeah, he's good, got a great know. podcast. Yeah, if you're not playing yeah. for Team Human, are you rooting to lose? Right. Exactly. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm on Team Human. I'm yeah. with Doug. Got, got gotta love losing the game, right? Yeah. Yeah. I always find people that say things are inevitable. And I, I have that definitely in me. I have the realist, cynical side of things and I can feel it. And I try to channel the optimism where I can. But if you, <laughs> like Henry Ford said, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. I, I think, that's, <laughs> right. A, I think that's a good place to start wrapping this up. Neil, before you tell people where to find you, I want one thing from you a, sure. call, a call to action advice anything what would it be and why or something to check out what would it be and why i here's you know to your listeners is you know you you have challenges before you in your life like everyone i would i would start to explore the idea that some of the best solutions may be ones you create with your neighbors right and and uh and i would you know get our book sharing cities activating the urban common you can go to shareable.net and it's available there for free you can download it and it has lots of great ideas about how you can do exactly that and what i love about how you described shareable you do journalism based solutions based journalism so it's not oh my god the sky is falling and we start crying you actually have something tangible there to give people hope and i think that's the most important thing when you try to create a better future is to show people how it can be better yeah exactly it's not even just hope to, it's also practical knowledge they can use and create what they need if it bleeds it leads that's a sucky way to do it thanks for coming on <laughs> yeah. today where can people find you neil learn more uh, oh i'm at uh, you know go to shareable.net for our website i'm at at uh, also at shareable s-h-a-r-e-a-b-l-e -E um, on Twitter, and you can find me uh, on Twitter also at Gornflow, G O R E N F L O. And thanks for tuning in, guys. If you want to follow me on Twitter, it's Matt Ward IO. Turns out there's a ton of Matt Wards. And go to disruptors.fm, enter your email address, subscribe so you get all the latest from the incredible guests we have on. Thanks for coming on today, Neil. Hey, thank you, Matt. It was a pleasure. And cheers, guys. Until next time, go make it happen and actually talk to someone.